to talk a little bit about models uh, in the sense of acute model view framework and how you can make them behave better, basically. Um, because we have run into a, a, a bit of a problem. Um, sometimes when we have, well, when we're building bigger applications and we get big blobs of data in, um, it's sometimes hard to uh, put those into a model properly and expose that to, for instance, a QML application, right? Um, you, you, you get all the day, you, 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 your backend just gives you a data changed and you just have one big blob of data and now you have to figure out what changed. Um, so in practice, we find that, you, that trying to do that manually, usually it, either it doesn't happen or it just happens with lots of shortcuts and it just doesn't work properly. So um, I, I, I set out when I saw that in a project being repeated over and over and over again to fix that once and for all. And that's what I'm gonna be mainly focusing on today. So I guesstimate that about 90% of all models are essentially lists, right? Uh, perhaps with different aspects in different columns, but if you're making something for QML consumption, it's essentially going to be a list unless you're using table view introduced last year. Um, about 9% would be trees, I guess. Uh, we're not going to be talking about those. 0.9% uh, might be real spreadsheet like tables, right? Really using tables. And the 0.1% are hierarchical monsters that are actually modeled by the API that we have. Um, I don't think anybody, has anybody used that kind of model type where you have basically nested tables? Uh, come to see me afterwards because I want to know a use case. I've never heard a good use case for that. So please, please come talk to me at the KDAP booth or during the party or something. I want to know. Um, so the QAbstract item API requirements are quite strict, right? They need a lot of detail. You have to tell, tell the API upfront what you're going to change uh, for inserts and removals and that kind of thing. Where are, am I, I going to insert my data? That's quite hard to do if you, don't, if you just get a data changed from, from your backend, right? Um, and you have to use unchanged, of course. But your data source doesn't give you that. So how do you deal with that? That's, that's the main problem. And I'm going to be focusing on lists because, like I said, I guesstimate that 90% of the use cases lists anyway. So whatever. So what have we seen in real code? People just use a model reset, right? You just, just do a full reset and that's it. That's easy, that's three lines of code, um, but it's not pretty, right? The results are horrible, you get horrible usability uh, in, your, uh, in your application. Um, we've seen partial solutions like, yeah, we handle some inserts and removals, but we're emitting a blanket data change for the whole model. Um, uh, that might be really expensive in real world cases where you have lots of complicated delegates, for instance. Um, or you get messy handcrafted place, a code in place that still cuts corners and lots of duplicating of all of the above. So um, what happens if you, if you just do a, uh, a model, uh, let me see, where is my creator? What happens if you just do the reset? Right, so we're, I have a little bit of an application that does that. Uh, where is it? So there it is. I, I made a process monitor and it's, uh, it, is, it is resetting every second, right? I, I, I can't navigate that. I, I, I'm using some animations in there uh, to, to make stuff appear, but I can't properly select stuff. And if I try scrolling, it will go back and this is horrible. Right? Even if it's not as animated as this, it's still horrible. So this is what you get if you use in your model, this is my model, uh, just here at line 50, in the mid, just to begin reset model and then set the new data and then end reset model, right? The end of this. That's, that's not where we want to be, right? So. Our, our deal would be a one-liner that we can reuse. Let's see how far we get. 
So what did I do to work towards a, a solution? Basically, I was really into uh, a Sean Perrin's uh, no raw loops kind of thing, so I started defining my own algorithm for that. I couldn't use a standard algorithm, unfortunately, because they don't have callbacks, like, yeah, we need to do an insert here and then a remove there and that kind of thing. So I just wrote my own. Um, and because I didn't want to pin the user of that thing down to a specific container type, I used templates. Um, to make it as flexible as possible. But I did need some assumptions, right? We're talking about the list type thing, maybe multiple columns, but still list type. Uh, the model keeps a copy of the data internally. That's not ideal, but yeah, it's, I needed to have some way of doing that. Um, the updated data, the updated data is set as a single block, right? That's the problem we're trying to solve, so we can safely assume that. But also both of these, so internal uh, data structure and what we get, are sorted or can be sorted in the same way based on some non-changeable key, right? So I can identify which items are the same item, even if the data changed, okay? Everything can change except for that key, so I can properly compare. Seems reasonable? I think so. Okay. So what do we need for this as inputs? Well, really, we only need two things. We need a less than implementation for our items in the container. Some way of comparing that, right? Or operator smaller than also works. And we need an has changed, right? We need some kind of function that tells us, did this data item change? It's still the same data item, but maybe it has different data now, yeah? And then what we do is we just walk through both data structures step by step and see where we need to be. Because they're both sorted, we can step through. And then we have event callbacks on, uh, that we call for inserts, removals, and data updates and, and, and whatnot for equality too. Uh, and they actually are gonna then handle the actual update and model signaling, right? So that looks something like this. It's a big template thingy. Um, so these are just all type devs to type name, right? That's just, just defined as type name, but this is more concept like, so I know what kind of thing I expect there. So um, we have a binary predicate less than, we have a binary predicate has changed, and then we have a couple of event handlers for on change, on insert, on remove, and on equal. And we just call this update collection and we're done. Looks simple, right? Yeah, well, mm, not much. It's much improved, at least, because um, we now have separate readable blocks for each of the separate things, right? We have to supply a separate insert, a separate remove, a separate uh, unchanged. So it's becoming much more readable what we're trying to solve. Uh, but it's still quite a lot of code. But it's not a raw loop. Well, almost. Um, so my next step was how can we integrate this in QAbstract item model, basically. Make it even simpler to use. Oh. Um, so that's what I did. So uh, a, a simplified version of that is this one. So we made a template. Um, we're using a QAbstract item model base model, so we're templated on that, so we can use a list model or a table model there, uh, depending on what we need. And we need the data type in there for internal reasons. And then we have the, our class updatable model, which inherits from that base model. Um, and the main method in there is going to be our update data, which takes uh, an iterator to source begin, source end. So that's our new data, right? Uh, it takes a pointer to the data or to, to the target container where we're storing our data. It takes the less than function and it has changes function. So we have less items to provide already. Um, and then internally, we have that on change, on insert, and on remove, and we just call that update collection function that I just showed. Okay, these are uh, all implemented. So they do the actually emitting of the changes. Um, so you use it by just subclassing updatable model, table model, or list model. 
implement data and flags and header data and, and, and what, what you normally do for when you make your own models, right? Uh, of course, you, they need to stay fast in themselves. That doesn't need pointing out, I hope. Uh, and then you add a, a, some kind of set data function that takes a new collection with the updated data. And from there, you call your, uh, well, what did I call it again? Um, update data from there. You only need to provide a less than or operator minus or operator less than on, uh, on your data type that you put in. And you still need to uh, implement has changes, which now must return a specific structure. But yeah. So how does it look? Well, for instance, if I have my new model, right, my new implementation of the model that does the proper updating, we get process model update data and it takes a new list of processes. And um, I provide a less than function, which is just comparing the, the process ID. That's, that's our unchangeable piece of data. Uh, and my has change is just compares the memory and the, that kind of thing uh, and see whether that changed, right? If it did change, I'm adding that uh, to, to the roles that have changed. That is a collection in the cha in data changes struct. And I say that my, 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 my sole column zero has changed. In this case, I just have one column. It can work with multiple columns. Uh, and I just return that. And then I just call update data on my new process list uh, on my internal data structure with this less than and the hash changes. Is it a one-liner? Not quite. I can get rid of the less than if I just have a, if my, if my, if my struct that I have in this process list is already comparable, which I, which I could do. Um, but my has change is still needs implementing. That's trivial though, right? It's just comparing and saying, okay, these roles have changed. I didn't find a way to get rid of that, sorry. So what does it look like in, oh, in real code? And uh, so my application has changed to, so I have my update data here, right? Um, and it's exactly what I had on the slide, only I hit that we're can now print what actually changed in the model. So we have this many inserts, this many removals, and this many updates every time. Um, so if I run that one, uh, let me see, there we are. I have my list of processes, and I can actually see that the view is much more stable. I can move around properly and uh, just works. It would insert new ones if I start, uh, I don't know, Chrome, something like that. You can see that there's new processes being added here. Uh, yeah, 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 I know. Okay. So the, the, this thing updates, and I can use all the animations that, that come with that, right? Uh, all the goodness that list view can do. So, um, and this is, this is reusable, right? This is not dependent on your specific contents of your model. All you need to do is use that template parameter on the top and that's it. Okay, so what can it do? It can take any forward iterable data structure as a data source. Um, it can deal with any storage container that is forward iterable and supplies some sort of insert. Right, and it's, uh, the, the better that insert is, the more efficient it's gonna be. And it tries to emit as few signals as possible. So it's gonna only emit an insert, not for every row, but if you have inserted multiple rows at the, at the same time, it's gonna just bundle those together in one insert. It's gonna emit one data change for the whole thing, uh, if uh, for every block of data that changed, right? Um, so it's gonna be, it's going to try to be economical with how many signals it sends because those cost you a lot of real-world performance. And it returns a number of operations. I don't know if that's nice for debugging, uh, I guess. 
There are some limitations. It only supports list-like models, no trees, mainly because there is no standard data structure for trees that I found. I find that very weird, but we don't have a proper anary tree structure standard. Um, we only have one set of change roles per row. So if you have multiple columns, you, I cannot deal with multiple different uh, role, uh, roles per column that changed. They, they, will just bunch to, they will just be bunched together. I'm not sure if that's a use case you'll, you'll ever run into anyway, because usually in QML you will use one column only, and then it's not a problem. Uh, and of course, data need to be sorted by key. Does that mean that you need to have your data presented in that order? Of course not. You can use a proxy model afterwards to sort it in any order that you need, right? But for your base model, you do need that key to sort on. So, how would you do that, that sorting, right? Now, I have a nice QML application, and I want to sort my data. Well, Q abstract item model, uh, Q abstract item model, Q, right? Q should be Q sort filter proxy model. I'm sorry, not QAM, but QSPM. Um, Q sort filter proxy model does filtering and sorting, right? But how does it deal with the actual changes um, in sort criteria or in the data that would affect the sort order? Well, if you look at it, it turns out that it's actually um, emitting layout changed for those. And turns out that QML doesn't use layout changed for animations. So what you want to have if a, if a row changes value and would therefore be sorted in a different place in your list, you want to have your item use, you, you want to have your proxy use a row move, not a layout change for that. So we needed to write our own proxy or our own proxy model again. Because um, what happens is, uh, ah, never mind. So I'll, I won't demo this one. Well, how much time do I have? How much time have I, have I had left? Uh, Ten minutes. Okay, good. Um, so, just introducing a sort proxy model to to report changes in the order using row moves, right? Again, this is just this is this is assuming that we have a list-like uh, uh, model, so we're not going to do moves between columns or anything like that. We're just, who uses that? Um, for both data changes and for sort criteria changes, um, I found out actually we probably want to be able to configure that, so I'll fix that. I'll uh, add that as a feature. Um, and I want it to be a drop-in replacement for QSort filter proxy model, uh, for the sorting parts at least of the API, so you can just use it as you would have used your QSort filter proxy model in between. So how does that look? Uh, so I have my main, I'm just using it in main for now. Um, I just, I still have my process model here, but now I'm using a sort proxy model which uh, takes that process model and I set the sort role to virtual memory for now in descending order to begin with and then I just registered that one as my sort model. And um, that will result in this. You can see that rows sometimes animate um, if they use less or more memory. Um, and these kind of animations are only possible if you have a move signal, right? If you don't use the move, then you just see the whole thing change like that. And that's not al always what you want. You might think that these kind of um, animations are just, just distracting. Yes, the way I wrote them, they're distracting, but if you have a proper designer designing these and not some hacker like me that just takes five minutes to, 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 to just quickly put them together. It actually helps a lot in the usability of your application because users can track what happens with the data much more easier, much easier than if data just changes, right? Um, but you can see if I start resorting that it becomes a bit of a mess uh, with so many animations going on. So, 
that's uh, probably something I want to have configurable um, in the future. But I'll, uh, I'll take uh, an hour or two to fix that at one point. So, conclusions. Yes, the problem is solvable, right? That's, that's the main conclusion. There is a generic solution to write models that actually provide proper update signals and proper inserts and proper removes, even if your data source doesn't. So um, it's not just a one-liner, unfortunately, but I think it's close enough. And uh, like I said, the other part of the story is that QSort filter proxy model does not provide moves, but we can provide our own model that does. Um, this uh, code is all available open source under a liberal license in the KD Toolbox GitHub repository, which you can find at that URL. I should have made a QR code. I saw somebody else do that. Sorry. Um, so find it there uh, or come ask at the KDAB booth if you can't find it. Um, that's basically what I wanted to say. I'm within the time. Any questions? I, I guess you have to wait for the microphone yeah. because it's being recorded. So if it's something that is more of a limitation in, uh, in the QSort uh, proxy filter model, why didn't you change that instead and propose the, the change with, uh, with a pull request? I'm sorry, again. Why didn't you put uh, the, these changes into QSort uh, sort proxy filter model? Uh, I tried, uh, I looked at the code but because it mixes filtering and sorting, the code for, and it works on trees, the code for that thing is actually really complex. Uh, and I uh, was getting scared. And we had a deadline in our project, and so I have a, I'll write my own, that's easier. Um, so that's, that's basically, basically the story. It's much easier um, because this thing is really complex. So it's uh, because it's only for lists. That's this right. one is only for list, but it also doesn't do filtering. So that makes the code that much easier. Hi, thanks for the talk and uh, uh, the sauce. Um, could you expand on how you reduce the amount of signals? You mentioned Sfine. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, well, the signals are not reduced using Sfine. That's just to optimize the inserts, basically. Um, because if you have a, a container that only allows inserting a single row, right, I need to call that method a couple times, which might reallocate multiple times, which is not very efficient. But if your container allows for multiple inserts at the same time, then that's obviously more, ex more efficient, right? Um, uh, how I uh, make uh, as, as few inserts as possible, I will show you in the... Uh, in the source code for this thing, um, because I can obviously expand that a little bit. Let me see. Um, basically, for this is the insert code. Let's use that as an example, this block here. Um, so what I do is that I find this one is if less than source it than target. That means that we have an insert going on. But then I go try, OK, how many other rows are also inserts? before I leave this block. And then I emit that as one on insert event, which, which, will, which will result in a single insert uh, uh, is pair of signals in the handler. Yeah, does that make sense? And I do similar things for removes and for updates, basically. Uh, updates are basically internally cached and then flushed uh, if I find a row that is identical to the last one. And so I make blocks. You can even configure what is considered a, uh, an identical or uh, how, how these combinations are made, right? If you have different roles, uh, whether that's okay or not. So you can, you, can, you, 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 you can tune that a little bit depending on your data, uh, how, did, how, how your data looks. Yeah, is that enough? Okay, good. More questions? No? Okay, I guess time for next speaker and thank you for your attention. Thank you.